Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to the panel, World Inside Out, Disruption, Inversion, and Play. Um, they are going to examine the ways in which individual and collective subjects across the Americas come into being through a variety of discursive and body practices that creatively upend norms, conventions, and power. Uh, if you did not hear my announcement, uh, one of our presentations will be in Spanish, so if you need translation, uh, you can find it out there. Uh, I'm going to introduce everybody at once, um, and they are sitting in the order in which I will introduce them, and then they will continue. Uh, first person will be Melissa Wilcox. She is Professor and Holstein Family and Community Chair of Religion at the University of California, Riverside. She recently published a book on the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, Queer Nuns, Religion, Activism, and Serious Parody, uh, and is beginning to work on two new projects, one on leather spirituality and the other on the interweaving of religious studies and queer theory. Luis Rincon Albo. Uh, is going is the sorry Colombian artist and scholar. He's currently a PhD candidate in the performance studies department and an adjunct professor in the Department of Art and Public Policy at New York University. His artistic and academic work focuses on the emergence of the political through the festive in Latin American and Caribbean aesthetics. Next will be Leticia Alvarado. She is an assistant professor in the Department of American Studies at Brown University. Her interdisciplinary research is situated at the nexus of Latina AOX, visual culture, and gender and sexuality studies. She is the author of Abject Performances, Aesthetic Strategies, and Latino Cultural Production. And finally, Joshua Chambers Letson. He is Associate Professor of Performance Studies at Northwestern University and the author of After the Party, A Manifesto for Queer of Color Life. He's currently working with Tabia Nyango to prepare Jose Esteban Munoz's The Sense of Brown for publication with Duke University Press. All right, please welcome our speakers. And trying to figure out how to get notes and a microphone in approximately the same place. Am I audible? Yes. Oh, you respond. You're so much better than my students. <laughs> I want to open today with four vignettes as touchstones for my explorations of religion, queerness, disruption, and play. Okay, the first is the condom savior vow written in 1991 by Sister X of the San Francisco House of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, a 40 year old religiously unaffiliated order of self-described queer nuns that's active on four continents today. The vow is often associated with the gold condoms you see here in this picture. Here they're being distributed by an acolyte as part of the sisters' mass against papal bigotry in 1987. And they appear again in this photo of the first, pardon me for checking my slides, of the first manifestation of the Paris House of the Order in 1990. The vow, printed here on a prayer card distributed by the Order at that time, reads as follows. We have gathered today to consecrate and receive the Holy Communion condom. As I take it on to myself, so shall I keep its ritual sacred. The condom is part of my life, part of my responsibility now. If I desire to live and let my sex partners live, I must sanctify my vow to hold the condom savior sacred. My seed is under siege by a horrific virus. Let me not become horrific as well with careless disregard for my life and the lives of those with whom I share the divine gift of love. I vow to look into my heart and further into my soul, where I know that my humanity and salvation depend on how sacred I hold the condom vow. Latex equals lust, latex equals life, latex equals love. 
The second vignette comes from an undated article on whosoever.org, which describes itself as an online magazine for LGBT Christians. The article begins like this. When I get flogged, I go into a trance state. That's the only thing I know to call it. Outside stimuli are not present. A newcomer looks intently at the heavyset man speaking from the corner. Another voice breaks in. It's like locking on to radar for me. I go on autopilot and just let the top take me away, or at least until his arm gives out. The room breaks into laughter and I glance at my watch. 9.15 p.m. We're running over and they like the building cleared by nine. So I take the hands of my lover to my right and the newcomer to my left. I hate to end this so soon, but some of us are going out for coffee afterward. If anyone wants to join us, we can continue for a while there. Let's close in the usual manner. Before I close my eyes, I see a circle of 16 men, most dressed in leather or uniforms, grasp hands. Some bow their heads, while others like myself turn our faces upward. After a few words of prayer, 16 strong voices join in a resonating, in Jesus' name, Amen. What's wrong with this picture? Absolutely nothing. And that's what this is all about. The third vignette comes from a 2002 collection of essays entitled Queer Jews. The book includes a piece by Jill Nagel, who describes an unusual Passover celebration. One Pesach, I received an invitation to a queer naked Seder, held at what was known to some as the Radical Fairy House, where lots of queer sex parties were held. The queer naked satyr began on the top floor and worked its way down to the dungeon. By that time, we'd divided into Egyptians and Jews, and the Egyptians were using the SM equipment to enslave the Jews, reenacting the Pesach story. Having been cast as Miriam, I was one of only a handful of women there, I led the naked Jews out of the dungeon with my tambourine, up onto the deck, and through the parted waters of the giant hot tub. For 40 years, we wandered in the desert staircase until we reached the top deck of Jerusalem, all in God's glorious skin and nothing else. We made our way back to the large living room and continued with the more traditional elements of the Pesach ritual. Finally, the fourth vignette comes from a conference paper given this past February by S.J. Krasnow, a religious studies scholar who works in particular with queer and trans Jews. The paper focused on Krasnow's research at a queer Talmud camp. One of the workshops at the camp focused on binding tefillin, the black leather straps that Orthodox Jewish men traditionally bind on their arms when preparing for prayer. In addition to reading traditional texts on tefillin, Krasnow explains, the group of mostly women and non-binary people at the workshop also read about leather and BDSM. Binding black leather can mean many things, and meaning is often multiple and open for contestation. These examples all bring religion and sexuality together in queer and playful ways. To some observers, they seem like sacrilege. Whether one's delighted or horrified by this transgression, either way, it produces a strong affective and embodied reaction that serves as a clue to just how powerfully each of these cases challenges accepted narratives about religion. In fact, in each of these scenes, religion is being profoundly queered. This isn't the ad queers and stir kind of queering. It's not just sliding the straight and cis folks down the pew and making space for queer people within existing religious practices. No, this is what happens when queer folks play by our own rules, when we play with religion. Such play creates profound religious change. It's partly this sense of dramatic alteration, I think, that causes the perception of sacrilege, despite the fact that those present in each of these scenes consider their practices to be sacred. Other aspects of the sacrilege are connected to what I've been calling the separation of church and sex, and to the perception that queer and trans bodies are always already irreversibly sexualized. Despite the dour representations we see in mainstream media and among some queer and trans theorists and activists, religion has always had elements of play. People in Catholic-influenced cultures think immediately of carnaval, but the examples are much farther ranging than that. Humor is an important part of many indigenous ritual traditions, for instance. And the Hindu de deity Krishna is said to engage in play 
Leela, with the cowherds he adores, Radha, who's here in the center, being primary among them. Religion, again, despite representations of it that we see in so many places today, has also always had elements of sex. The late Argentinian queer theologian Marcela Altaus Reed writes of doing theology without underwear, allowing the scent of sex to mingle with the spirit of God. While this might be an innovation in the rarefied realm of Christian theological production, Anyone who screamed or whispered, oh God, ay Dios mío, in the throes of passion, <laughs> might pause for just a moment to consider why we generally don't consider that to be religion. <laughs> but here I'm talking neither about traditional stories of the gods, nor about formal theological writing, nor even about ejaculations of the verbal or any other sort. The vignettes I've described are all thoughtfully planned practices that intervene in traditional religions in profoundly queer and playful ways. They produce at least two forms of religious disruption. First, they make religion work for queer cultures. And second, in so doing, they fundamentally alter accepted understandings of the religion itself, producing a religious queer panic in both heteronormative and homonormative circles. That panic, as I've alluded to already, tells us just how profound and effective these changes actually are. I remarked in my book on the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence that in a time and place where an AIDS diagnosis was a near certain death sentence and many churches interpreted the disease as divine retribution for queer sex, the promise held out by the condom savior was likely far more credible than the one offered by Jesus. Yet there's also significance in the sisters' borrowing of Christian ritual. They could have had a pledge to use condoms, not a mass. They could have had a protest against the Pope without also having a liturgy. They could have held rituals without riffing on Catholicism. That they chose masses isn't just a result of the happy accident that placed three retired nuns' habits in a very gay closet in San Francisco in the late 1970s. It's because the masses worked. The papal mass and the condom savior mass didn't mock Christianity. They parodied it and queered it in ways that reclaimed reinvented and redefined Christian practice with or without the attendant belief in God and Christ for a community reeling from the twin assaults of AIDS and violent repression. The sisters are a common target for Christian homophobia, transphobia, and homonormative revulsion, not because they call themselves nuns, but because they're engaged in creating a deeply queer re-envisioning of Christianity, despite being neither a religious group nor a specifically Christian one. Like the sisters, and these are not entirely separate groups either, Christian leathermen are also engaged not just in creating space for queer people within Christianity, but in creating a deeply queer Christianity through their practice, even when they're just meeting for discussion and prayer. One of the earliest spiritual organizations for queer and trans leather folk was the Defenders, which started in the early 1980s under the auspices of Dignity, a queer and trans Catholic organization. The Defenders describe their purpose in part as, quote, fostering an individual and collective integration of our spirituality and our sexuality. Practice has real effects in the world, as we all know. You can't pray together in leather and work for the integration of leather and Catholicism without changing both. Those who oppose and deride the Defenders and other groups like them know this at some level. By the same token, the Queer Naked Seder and the Tefillin Workshop also changed Judaism. 
retaining far more of the traditional Seder than the sisters do of the traditional Mass. The participants in the Queer Naked Seder not only told the story of the Passover, they enacted it. They lived it out in ways that the participants in a more traditional Seder, even if they're using a queer, feminist, or otherwise progressive Haggadah, never do. But most people who hear about their innovations in the Seder can't get any farther than the sex. And since we have this odd and inaccurate idea that religion and sex can't be in the same space, focusing on the sex negates the religion. Even mentioning tefillin and BDSM-style bondage in the same breath causes raised eyebrows. Somehow sex has become frivol frivolous and religion serious, another reason why the two apparently can't go together. But if we acknowledge that religion, sex, and play have a long-standing relationship, they're a long-term trio, if you will, then we can refuse to dismiss these queer disruptions of religion while also being open to their playfulness. So what's happening with play here? To begin to answer that question, I think we also need to ask what exactly play means. In English, it has many different connotations. To play, for instance, is to have fun, to joke and be humorous, to be silly. It's also to engage in imagination. This is one of the few meanings of the term that the anthropologist Andre Drogers engages in his sometimes frustratingly limited work on religion and play. And play can be a form of abandon, of letting go of how things ought to be done, of disrupting the rules and the status quo. Queer religious play then, including queer religiosexual play, intervenes in both sex and religion in many different ways. It focuses on the silly in religion, and as the sisters in particular remind us, and as this conference is premised on, play and humor are potent sources of protest and resistance. Queer religious play engages in imagination too, imagining otherwise, as a Sean Crawley writes in Black Pentecostal Breath, and creating that which it imagines. Without imagination, there can be no change of any significance, but without play, there's also no enactment of that change. And queer religious play, perhaps especially queer religiosexual play, both engages in and produces abandon, acting back on the actors in the production of ecstasies, spaces out of place, literally other worlds, ek stasis. To play with something is also called, in English, toying with it. I've been toying with the role of play in queering religion, but the people I've been talking about are also toying with religion itself. Again, to say such a thing often invokes a sense of frivolity, and with that comes an implication of disrespect. But when religion turns deadly, killing queer and trans bodies, minds, hearts, and souls, shouldn't it be disrespected? So if religion becomes a toy in this sense within queer religious and religio-sexual play, maybe religion is a sex toy. I'm playing again, but very much in Crawley's sense of imagining otherwise. Sex toys aren't only titillations for the prurient. Most often they're tools for the production of ecstasy, sparks for the imagination, props that are integral to the success of a scene. Maybe religion is too. So because I'm reading a little bit more slowly, I have a section on play as failure that I'm gonna skip. So I'm just gonna say then briefly that it seems appropriate to close with this image from the cover of the sisters' historic safer sex guide called Play Fair. In this presentation on queer religio-sexual play, I've been toying too, playing with the ideas of religion, queerness, sex, subversion, disruption, power, and change. These are all new ideas for me, so I had fun putting them together to bring to you, playing with them, and I look forward to your questions and provocations. Thank you.
Buenas tardes. Um, as it was announced, I'm going to read my presentation in Spanish. Um, so I hope you got your translation. Um, Carnaval, la reversible fiesta de los muertos, las muertas y las muertes. Voy a empezar con tres citas de tres canciones de carnaval de mi ciudad, Barranquilla, Colombia. Coroncoro se murió tu mae, déjala morir. Coroncoro se murió tu pae, déjala morir. Esa canción es de la niña Emilia y se titula Coroncoro. La segunda, no, no me maten, déjenme gozar. Mátenme si quieren después del carnaval, de Dolce y Gutiérrez. Y la última, Mata tu toro, macaco. Macaco mata al toro. De Joe Arroyo. Y la canción se titula Macaco. En febrero 25 de 1881, estallaron en la isla caribeña de Trinidad, lo que se conoce hoy como las Cambulay Riots, o revueltas de Cambulay. Revueltas. Entre los años de 1881 y 1884, la revuelta de carnaval se diseminaron por la gran mayoría de los archipiélagos y el litoral caribe, en lo que para muchos marca un momento transicional entre el carnaval como una fiesta de claras raíces europeas, por un lado, y por el otro, una creciente apropiación por parte de las poblaciones negras, indígenas y criollas de una tradición que desde finales del medioevo gozaba de una ambigua valoración por parte de los mismos europeos. Narra el historiador John Cowley en su libro Carnival Campbell en Calypso, que el origen de la revuelta fue una serie de regulaciones y prohibiciones del carnaval debido al temor que existía por parte de las autoridades coloniales de la utilización de las fiestas para planear insurrecciones anticoloniales. Las organizaciones de carnaval, nombradas con el curioso nombre de Societies for the Purpose of Dancing and Innocent Amusement, sociedades con el propósito de la danza y el entretenimiento inocente, pero que secretamente se llamaban con nombres asociables a la organización militar, como convoys, regimientos, batallones, escuadrones, etc., solo contribuían a incendiar la imaginación paranoica de las autoridades coloniales. De este modo, las revueltas sirvieron como confirmación a sospechas originadas desde 1798, año en el cual el control de Trinidad pasó de España al Imperio Británico. Lo que las nuevas autoridades coloniales de entonces encontraron fue una mezcla extraña de prácticas festivas españolas, francesas, indígenas, arawak y africanas, mayoritariamente Congo, ya que debido a la revolución haitiana y a una cédula del rey de España, un gran número de dueños de plantaciones se trasladaron a Trinidad. Las sospechas sobre la laxitud del control sobre las actividades festivas ejercida por ambos españoles y franceses fueron confirmadas en 1805, cuando una supuesta conspiración fue descubierta. La prueba principal con la cual fueron condenadas cuatro personas a ejecución, otras tantas a mutilación y muchas más a ser públicamente latigadas, fue una canción cantada el viernes de carnaval que decía «El pan que comemos es la carne del hombre blanco». El vino que tomamos es la sangre del hombre blanco. E la española, recuerda a la española. Gran parte del esfuerzo de la investigación criminal se concentró en el desciframiento y traducción de la canción que originalmente era cantada en creol, seguida por el espanto al, al encontrar no solo la reversión obvia del ritual cristiano de comer y beber la sangre y el cuerpo de Cristo, sino también la invitación festiva a asesinar a los blancos representantes del poder colonial. Lo que una perspectiva genealógica nos indica es que, en primera medida, el estudio del carnaval dentro del contexto del archipiélago y litoral caribeños tiene al menos dos corrientes principales. Por un lado, la amenaza que la fiesta representaba y representa para el orden establecido significó la adopción, la adopción de un enfoque criminológico en el cual el carnaval, con sus ruidosas y caóticas prácticas, operó la confirmación de la inclinación de estos pueblos por los llamados bajos fondos o la mala vida. Por el otro lado, pero complementando la labor de la criminología, los carnavales y sus desmanes fueron utilizados como confirmación de la pulsión primitiva de sus practicantes. Este es incluso el caso de Fernando Ortiz, importante estudioso del folclore cubano, 
cuyo estudio Los Negros Brujos, publicado originalmente a mediados del siglo XX, alaba la utilidad de los métodos criminológicos italianos para confirmar el nexo natural entre la vida negra, el crimen y el primitivismo. El nexo natural tiene que ver con la condena que se le hace a lo festivo a ser expresión de un cierto primitivismo que subsecuentemente vino a servir como fundamento a la designación de lo folclórico en Latinoamérica en general y en el Caribe en particular. El carnaval, en este sentido, ha sido enmarcado como una experiencia de la reversión que tiene su culmen en lo que podría denominarse como una condena absoluta a la reversibilidad. Esta condena se hace manifiestamente evidente en la forma como el carnaval es convertido en el epítome del folclore, un concepto que tiene un fuerte y profundo arraigo en Latinoamérica y el Caribe, pero que ha servido para hacer la reducción del carnaval a una pura pervivencia del pasado que no tiene mucho que ver con lo moderno y mucho menos con lo futuro. En este momento iba a mostrar un video. Esta, oh. Arreglamos los problemas técnicos y parece que voy a poder mostrar el video. sonido imagínense el ruido se pueden imaginar el, el resto. Conga irreversible. También, también puede haber carnaval en silencio, lo juro que sí. Conga irreversible, un performance comisionado para la Bienal de La Habana de 2012, hace manifiesto algo que podríamos llamar irreversibilidad reversible. La danza de la conga habanera, una comparsa fuertemente asociada al carnaval cubano. Ay, la cara. Una comparsa fuertemente asociada al carnaval cubano es puesta a marchar en reversa. La canción, compuesta por el jazzista cubano Giovanni Terry, invierte tanto la composición como el canto. En términos prácticos, la reversibilidad parece ser lograda. La acción no termina representando una fiesta de carnaval, sino que se convierte momentáneamente en una. Los espectadores, espectadores y las espectadoras se unen a la comparsa y rápidamente, rápidamente se convierten en marchantes que danzan hacia el frente. Tal vez ese, en ese sencillo hecho radica la irreversibilidad de la comparsa de conga que el título del performance anuncia. Los carpinteros, el colectivo cubano que realiza la obra, mucho más conocidos por sus instalaciones, dibujos, fotografías y esculturas que por sus piezas de performance, traen al contexto artístico una cotidianidad que históricamente no ha pertenecido al mundo del arte. Y si lo hace, su pertenencia radica en ser material puramente del pasado, y más aún un material que no pertenece propiamente a la historia. Y justamente allí radica la emergencia política de un concepto como el de folclore, que señala el italiano Antonio Gramsci en una breve reflexión sobre el rol político de la disciplina del folclore en Europa, que su principal función es la de reducir todos sus objetos a ser puramente un material cuyo único valor es el de ser recolectado, catalogado y preservado en su forma originaria o autóctona. Pero en este breve espacio en el que me he propuesto compartir algunas reflexiones históricas sobre la relevancia de lo político en el carnaval, quisiera enfocarme en el sentido de luto que le otorga el vestuario negro que contrasta con el colorido que normalmente es esperado del carnaval. El sentido fúnebre, que es parte vital del carnaval caribeño, no se contrapone a lo festivo y constituye una forma particular en que el performance de carnaval anula la supuesta oposición entre tristeza y alegría. El carnaval, me atrevo a decir yo, es un sistema que nos permite reunirnos nuevamente con nuestros muertos y nuestras muertas. 
Mi hermano, el músico y folclorista cubano Anier Alonso del Valle, llama esto la beta congo, que estructura la fuerte relación del carnaval caribeño con la muerte. Yo vengo de una ciudad en el litoral caribe colombiano donde la cumbia y la danza de los congos guerreros son los bailes más importantes. La temporada de carnaval se inicia con una danza muy similar a las que conmemoran las Cambulay Riots de Trinidad. La danza del garabato del carnaval de Barranquilla abre la temporada festiva con una pelea danzada de palos entre un bailarín y la muerte. La victoria de la danza sobre la muerte abre la temporada que cierra varias semanas después, el martes antes del miércoles de ceniza, cuando las calles se llenan con una procesión funeraria que despide a un muerto que se llama Joselito Carnaval. Nadie sabe de qué murió exactamente. Se rumora que Joselito fallece producto de un exceso de felicidad. Ese día nos vestimos de negro y desfilamos por las calles llorando a risotadas y riendo llenas de dolor. En esta conciencia festiva que coexiste con la muerte, existen claves que intencionalmente nos han sido heredadas y que nos permiten encontrar en la fiesta y el performance festivo maneras de mantener a nuestras muertes presentes. Para recibir consejo, para agradecer las luchas que libraron para heredarnos estas músicas, danzas y formas de congregación que llamamos carnaval y también para perdonarles sus errores. Para que nos recuerden que nosotras también vamos a morir. En los últimos meses he pensado la fiesta junto al más reciente libro de Joshua Chambers Letson, que está aquí sentado conmigo y me siento muy honrado, titulado After the Party, a Manifesto for Queer Color Life. Este libro, me atrevo a afirmar, nos regala unas claves invaluables sobre el funcionamiento de la fiesta y su intrínseca relación con la muerte y con el campo de los estudios del performance al rendir homenaje al cubano José Esteban Muñoz, y las fiestas, que, las fiestas que tuvieron lugar alrededor de su muerte en 2013. Desde el título mismo, la muerte aparece como la promesa y la esperanza de vida, de más vida que, sin embargo, pasa por la cruel realidad de la cercanía y amenaza de muerte que sufren personas queer y trans de color. Este libro ha sido iluminador porque retoma la relación del campo de los estudios del performance, en particular el tema de la fantasmagoría de Ridiana en la obra de Diana Taylor, para pensar cómo el performance nos el performance nos permite no solo recordar a los y las muertas, sino que nos permite continuar reuniéndonos en el performance. Patricia Ariza, directora teatral y activista feminista colombiana, afirmó en una entrevista conducida por Leticia Robles Moreno en el Instituto Hemisférico en 2015, que una motivación importante en su proceso de crear fiestas conmemorativas en la plaza pública con mujeres víctimas del conflicto armado, fue encontrar que en los periodos de mayor violencia en Colombia, el número de fiestas populares se incrementaban. La fiesta, muy al contrario de lo que afirman quienes la reducen a una simple válvula de escape que permite la continuidad del status quo, se ha convertido en un sistema complejo que más allá de permitirnos recordar o rememorar a los muertos y muertas, nos permite volver a reunirnos para seguir conspirando en el presente y no renunciar al horizonte del futuro que nos pertenece a todas y a todos, tanto los que nos consideramos vivos como los que ya no están entre nosotros y las muchas muertes que faltan por acontecer en esta larga noche de más de 500 años. Gracias. Uh, good afternoon. I want to start by first thanking Marcial and Diana for their invitation to be a part of this panel, um, and more broadly for the opportunities for engagement throughout the Encuentro. Today, thinking specifically with the work of artist Sandra Ibarra, uh, who is here, and this is not awkward at all, um, uh, I will share some of the principal claims from my newish book, Abject Performances, Aesthetic Strategies in Latino Cultural Production. And there's no se oye? Más cercas? Okay. Th there should also be slides. Oh. Can we put it in presentation mode? Uh, 
Uh, bueno, I'll share a little bit of the arguments from my book, um, if following Sandra's work, then also um, trace some of the places where she's leading me. Um, there we go. Uh, in her contribution to the special issue of women in performance, lingering in Latinidad, theory, aesthetics, and performance in Latina O studies, Ibarra brings together a series of photographic performance works that center the cockroach, a racialized emblem of Latinidad in all its quote, objection, disgust, invisibility, hypervisibility, and infestation, in a piece she calls ectisis, the molting of a cucarachica. The molting cockroach delivers us into a process of shedding and emergence under the sign of an abject racial signifier. A, sh a short artist statement precedes a set of images in which Ibarra reflects on a similar process of shedding for the Latinx subject. Aren't Latinidad and Spickhood similarly fucked? Ibarra asks. The fuckedness of always already being the same or of resemblance in repetition. With this, Ibarra homes in on a chain of signification within US racializing schemas, wherein Latinidad is always linked to objection, to spickhood. The accompanying images in the series elaborate on the links in this chain of signification to illuminate a Sisyphean repetition, wherein the shedding of skin, the attempt at transformative escape into the respectable is doomed to return to a similar, identical embodied formation, always circumscribed by abjection. In Triptych, for example, Ibarra lays next to a textile iridescent bronze cockroach skin the approximate length of her own body within an emptied pool. She wears a dark bikini bottom and pasties over her nipples. A pair of platform peep-toed heels rest diagonal to her feet immediately under the twin skin, the footwear donned by Ibarra as roach before the shedding that she purposed uh, proposes ultimately reveals fucked resemblance. Also from, Ecdysis, from the Ecdysis series, Molting Showgirl and Molting Tortillera, show Ibarra laying in bikini bottoms and pasties next to elaborate jewel tongued ruffled costumes anchored by impossibly high heels. While Carcass simply shows the detritus of performance, heels, a cape, a wig, and a headpiece in the sand off a littered desert highway evocative of the border region of the U.S.'s southwest. In these photographs, the molted skins range from cockroach shape to those of eroticized Latina performance, costumes donned on the burlesque stage and shed during striptease. The visual scape of this series brings to the fore the gendered and sexualized vectors of the abject roach, as well as its queer otherness, as signaled by the invocation of the tortillera. Within this doom shedding cycle, however, Ibarra also equates the ruffles and heels that characterize the ideal exotic good neighbor, as embodied by Carmen Miranda with exaggerated hand gestures, wandering eyes, and tutti frutti hat, to the emblem of the worst of the US's neighboring country, who scurry across the border to sully the nation. While revealing the insistent externally imposed taint of abjection, regardless of the shape of exterior presentation of skin, Ibarra reframes abjection's potentiality. At opposite ends of interpolative mappings that situates Latinidad in relation to the nation, both of these skins shed to reveal the same Ibarra, exposed flesh, sparkling nipples, glistening with queer and gentle um, intensity. With the citation of burlesque in each image through her pasties, Ibarra too calls forth the spaces of suciedad within which De Vargas has located the persistent sustainability of queer world making. This persistent and productive survival is brought to bear on sites of racialized crossing toward abject incorporation into the nation like the U.S.-Mexico border, invoked by the landscape backdrop of ecdysis. Ibarra's work then insists on the queer abjection of Latinidad, of the immigrant, of the possibilities of the angential performer working with and through abjection. 
In abject performances, I argue that these aesthetic strategies have and can still offer us tools for navigating what my late mentor, Jose Esteban Muñoz, called a phobic majoritarian public sphere. I contend that instead of turning to works whose techniques we might call realist, illustrative, or journalistic, techniques often marshaled in the service of positive representation and appeals for the national incorporation of minoritized communities, we consider concurrent routes charted through abduction, working with negative affects to capture experiences that lie far outside of mainstream inspirational Latino-centered social justice struggles, messy experiences not always embraced within our communities. Laden with quotidian meaning, I understand abjection as tied to a negative process of subject formation, the necessary excess to be cast out in order for the normative subject to cohere. This process allows us to reflect on the formation of a national identity formed by casting out of the casting out of undesirable bodies, people of color, queer folk, whose own interiority is diminished. The result is a prognosis of the establishment of dominance through the repeated casting out of those subjects that threaten to reveal the inequalities of a national body insistent on a legacy of freedom and equality. Building specifically on critical race and Latinx scholarship, I understand this abject realm is comprised of a largely minoritized populace, providing a site to think about collectivity through negative affect as well as its resistant engagement with identity politics writ large. I want to be clear that I'm not centering here on a dynamic of ontological desire, a desire to be abject, but one of recognition of a social location and a strategy to propel this recognition into a destabilizing disruptive force. Recent neo-nativist utterances on the national stage may seem to call for a counter strategy of creating distance between abjection and minoritized community, a distancing from that molting abject queer figure of Ibarra's oeuvre. But conservative performances of racism only underscore what we've known, what we in communities of color have long known about the structure of nationalist fervor in the US. It is within the politics of respectability and its seemingly su successful dynamic of incorporation, a known route we might be tempted to fall back on, that I instead seek to parse out strategies for continued demands and expansion of what we understand as justice and freedom. Latinx abject performances, like Ibarra's, reveal abjection not as a resource for empowerment, fueled by a desire for normative inclusion, but as a resource geared toward an ungraspable alternative social organization, a not yet here, perhaps a world turned upside down, illuminated by the aesthetic. I close abject performances with an analysis of the unfinished collaborative performance Untitled Skins by Ibarra and Sofia Wang, which we can read as an expanded consideration of the malting Cucara Chica, now writhing, pulsing from, encased, uh, from within encased uh, translucent synthetic cocoons. In this 25 minute work in progress, relational sociality is tethered to the bodies on display. The disquieting affects triggered by the performance peer's physicality, whose visual identitarian markers are obscured by the thin fabric within which they are encased, nonetheless signal a project mark by racialization. A sense of dark hair, gendered bodily figuration, the revelation of surnames in performance annou announcements all invite us into the realm of the comparative or relational. The ultimate shedding of skin at the end of the performance reveals subjects, individual bodies that might be recognized along racial sight lines, but whose encasement activates productive, the less narratively clear affective binds. Instead of bodily narrative coherence, the reach and wrench between performers gesture at the connective sinews of coalitions across minoritized populations as represented by the performers, the queer optics for understanding its offerings, and the fecund possibilities of its political implication. This incomplete forward glancing project encourages a robust relational framework focused on what is shared by distinct racial formations, where those projects converged, are brought into harmonious intimacy, and where they repel violently. 
it suggests a consideration of the performative function of the skins we're in, those embodied, materially shaped structures within which we might navigate identitarian projects relationally, and ends with the open question of the function of shedding, of release from the skin of performance, one answered potentially by the question posed in Ecdysis with the always fuckedness of Latinidad and spickhood. But this malt, this shedding, also offers a heuristic for relation and expanding the bounds of the discursively construed human. In his theorization of brownness, Munoz offers a rubric of attunement towards seeing and feeling in common, a capacious rubric meant to stretch outside the confines of any group formation, even outside the limits of the human and the organic. Pivoting from and with abjection, Ibarra builds on this sense of brown. Indeed, for the performance series in Cuatro Patas, Ibarra co-curates with artists Neo Bustamante, the two right of the featured artists that they quote, um, dissolve boundaries between animal and human while exploring the transformational and pleasurable possibilities of, non of the non-human figure. Arriving here through their curatorial invitation to take on the corporal reality of the abject, the degraded, the non-human, the subhuman, and the animal. This invitation emerges in both Ibarra and Bustamante's oeuvres, specifically for Ibarra here in the citation of the racialized cockroach, as well as the writhing, pulsing, maggot-like figure of untitled skins that leads us to ponder relational sociality. I want to close my comments today by very briefly elaborating on this invitation and sharing just a bit of where Ibarra is taking me. In a book I am currently calling Cut Horde Suture, Aesthetics in Relation, I pair the work of distinctly racialized contemporary artists to query the possibilities of contestation within supranational routes of art circulation. Oh, the slides, they're there. Um, um, the second section of this project takes up hoarding as gesture to continue to think with Ibarra in relational pairing with African-American artist Doreen Garner on the hoarding of racialized objects for artistic presentation, their distribution in U.S. cultures of distinction, and as effective responses to racial projects, even or especially pathologized responses, which emerge as generative sites of shared resistance. As we have gleaned from works already discussed, but especially in her nude laughing, there it is, um, which she's performing on Friday. Um, Ibarra gathers both objects of spectacular racial limitation as well as those of unachievable whiteness in works that trigger laughter, both hysterical and depressive. Gardner's gathering of adornment associated with the black body are presented as bulbous disembodied installation or paired in claustrophobic performance provoking a violent sense of uncanny. Ibarra and Garner's shared hoarding, I want to argue, seeds a sense of malady, hysteria, and claustrophobia. As I begin to work, the work of thinking how this relational pairing offers us rubrics for artistic maneuvers of informed and resistant engagement, I'm led, I, I'm led by what disability studies scholar Anna Malo calls mad feminism that entreats us to center, quote, subject positions at the margins of madness, including people of color seen as emotionally erratic, as well as with what Larry Lafan takes LaFontaine Stokes theorizes as the loca, a literal madwoman, but also its queer invocation. A loca, he tells us, suggests a form of hysterical identity, pathologized at the clinical level, scandalous at the popular one, and constitutive of the individual lacking sanity, composure, or ascription to dominant norms, a category forged in and through social structures that readily attach to both Garner and Ibarra. It is not lost to me that both Ibarra and Gardner hoard objects within an order of uneven accumulation of capital, social and cultural, an order that constricts and burdens brown and black bodies for which malady might seem a natural response. As this project develops, I hope to follow strains of queer color critique and disability studies to parse Ibarra and Gardner's offerings to elaborate on what they might tell us 
of accumulation and minoritarian disruption from locas. As described by Jody Melamed, racial capitalism functions as a technology of anti-relationality, a technology for reducing collective life to the relations that sustain neoliberal democratic capitalism. A relational consideration of Ibarra and Gardner's work then not only helps us to reflect on material accumulation across disparate registers of racial capitalism, but also offers us a countering technology within those global circuits of power unbeholden to the nation state that facilitate the exhibition of their work. Thank you. Um, when we pull up the slide, I'll just say quickly that um, uh, the text that I'm about to present uh, calls for inversion and, or sorry, calls for disruption and performs an inversion, but play is sorely missing, um, for which I apologize. It's been a rough couple of months and I think I lost my smile a little, but it'll come back. Uh, okay. One. For some time, we hung above our bed two sheets from Felix Gonzalez Torres's 1990 paper stack untitled The End. The sheets of paper that make up untitled The End form a rectangular plinth that rises to an ideal height of 22 inches. Each sheet is a rectangular white expanse with a black band of about one and a half inches wrapping the border. As people encounter the work, they can take these sheets with them, diminishing the sculpture in size, unless the exhibitor or owner ensures its replenishment, the end, as in death. While it's not uncommon to find the paper stacks compared to minimalist sculpture, some have noted that they also evoke tombstones. Gonzalez Torres gestures towards death, mourning, and grief throughout his body of work, including a number of stacks, such as 1990's untitled Death by Gun, which offers a visual catalog of the highly racialized and gendered nature of U.S. gun deaths. But death is also a thematic possibility in 1992's untitled Republican Years, which offers a revision on the single black border of untitled The End by adding and setting within it a thin black band. For Robert Storr, the black banded works evoke a funeral announcement, perhaps a funeral for the end of the Republican years, as 1992, when the stack emerged, marked the end of 12 years of the Republican Party's control of the White House, perhaps a funeral for all um, for all the people who died as a direct result of the policies of the Reagan and Bush administrations. The United States saw AIDS death reach over 120,000 by 1990. This was also the year public health authorities reported that black and brown women, under 20% of the nation's population at the time, constituted over 70% of women living with AIDS. The end, Republican years as a mass grave, Republican years as an ongoing period that marked and marks the end for too many black and brown women, trans and queer folk. Gonzalez Torres's sheets of paper look like giant funeral announcements without any text, but you can write the names of your own dead in these funeral announcements. When hung on the wall, the black bands wrapping the periphery of the sheets of Untitled The End might suggest black frames around white canvases or projection screens. So project your dead, but also the living into them as well. There is the way that the black band with a white center formally mirrors whiteness as it occupies the center of the frame as in popular portraits of the first wave of the AIDS crisis in the US. On such occasions, black and brown life and death is held at the margins, held at the periphery, held, contained, but still held on to, so it can mark the limit and function as a surplus reserve to be consumed and cast aside. But if we see in Untitled The End a frame and a projection screen, it is the richness of black and brown life in the time of proliferating deaths and endings that I choose to cast into the center of this frame. Doing so, I imagine the stark white center giving way to rich hues of black, brown, and every other color. 
Sometimes I'd look at the sheets from Untitled The End hanging above the empty bed, itself marked by the imprints of absent bodies, and imagine that the sheets were portraits of Gonzalez Torres or his lover and his lover, Ross Laycock. Felix first materialized Untitled The End in 1990. This was around the time that Laycock was dying from AIDS. Near the end, they lived together in Los Angeles, and as Gonzalez Torres wrote of that time, Ross and I spent every Saturday afternoon visiting galleries, museums, thrift shops, and going on long, very long drives all around LA, experiencing and enjoying the magic hour when the light makes everything gold and magical in that city. The end, he continued, Ross was dying right in front of my eyes and leaving me. Here's what I like to imagine. In the center of one frame is a portrait of Felix. In the center of the other is a portrait of Ross. Both are full with the fullness of living. Both are basking in light that makes everything gold and magical. I know what Laycock looked like because Gonzalez Torres used photographs of his lover in some of his works. This includes a work made in the wake of Laycock's death, the haunting, untitled Ross and Harry, comprised of a grainy, ghostly photograph of a shirtless Laycock playing fetch with their dog. A little Googling and you can find a snapshot of the couple together at a beach. Gonzalez Torres looking regnant at the center of the frame, Laycock just beside him. Both are sporting sunglasses as they bathe in golden light. When I imagine their portraits taking up the center of the black frame, I like to imagine that these photographs were taken during the magic hour, which is to imagine that their photographs were taken by Star Montana, a photographer who stages the brownness and queerness of life in Los Angeles as it bathes in the city's gold and magical light. Montana was born in the Boyle Heights neighborhood of Los Angeles and would have been three or four around the time Gonzalez Torres resided there. In one series, Montana produces stunning portraits of people in East LA, brown people in the center of the frame held in the light of the magic hour. As Juana Maria Rodriguez has described it, Montana's subjects, the strangers and friends that populate her vision of East Los Angeles, enter her light and present themselves to future ancestors. Another end, since the magic hour comes at the end of the day. By offering up her photograph for future ancestors, Montana seems to suggest that endings give way to other beginnings. There is something black, this is something black and brown folks know a thing or two about, having become ourselves in the wake of any number of endings and apocalypses, the proliferating ending of worlds brought about by the destructive and overlapping forces of colonialism, racial capitalism, cis-heteropatriarchy, and white supremacy. To think of the pieces of the untitled The End as portraits of our own lost ancestors who should have been our peers and mentors was a way of remembering something that we couldn't forget anyway when we hung these sheets above our bed. My partners and I are the children of the Republican years and the Clinton years, which were in their own Gingrichian way still the Republican years. If the manifestly phobic environment of the 1990s taught us to believe anything about our sexual selves in those sexually formative years, it was that queer sex equals death. Following Essex Hemphill and Marlon Riggs, we learned to live with each taste and exchange of fluid with this thought. Now we think as we fuck, this nut might kill us. This kiss could turn to stone. It's hard. You internalize that kind of thing. Start to think of yourself as the inevitability that they tell you you are and cannot let yourself continue to be. Death, disease, racial and sexual monstrosity. It gets to be a lot. The pressure builds up and maybe you cut away to bleed the messiness out. Or maybe you come up with new ways of loathing yourself and of forgetting that you're doing other people's hating of you for them. Or maybe you try to follow the command issued by someone else's desire for you not to be. When the struggle is real, the death drive is realer. 
Under these circumstances, the bed and the sexual landscapes akin to it can be zones of powerful transgression, world-making, desire, danger, and self-denying shame all at once. The bed is a place where the pains and pleasures of brown, black, femme, and queer fleshiness get caught up in any number of ends and endings. The end, the vagina, the rectum, or some other terminal port, port of entry as a pathway to the grave, yes, but also towards the excesses and pleasures of being and of being with others. So we hang this reminder of someone else's end above the bed, and we think as we fuck, look, here we are living and loving instead of loathing. Here we are holding on to each other, but also holding on to those who aren't here anymore. Because when we think as we fuck, this nut might kill us, and that this kiss could turn to stone. And when we fuck under the sign of Felix and Ross, who aren't here anymore, in a queer kind of way, we are keeping in mind the ones whose ends we are living after. Keeping them in mind, which is to say, keeping some part of them alive and in our bodies as we think, as we fuck which is a queer mode of reproduction, if you think about it, a queer of color mode of reproduction. Two, if I am projecting queer, trans, femme, black, and brown life onto the sheets of paper hanging above the bed, I am also thinking of black feminist theorists working at the intersection of black, queer, and lesbian thought, such as Audre Lorde, Hortense Spillers, Sharon Patricia Holland, and Amber Musser, who have taught us about the ways in which the erotic becomes overdetermined by the effects of racialization, histories of racial objectification, and interlocking technologies of racial and sexual subjection. As Musser writes, some people circulate as highly charged affective objects while simultaneously be being positioned outside of the parameters of normative sexuality and subjectivity. We see this acutely in the ways that black women are positioned as the fleshy limit of theory. Within the orders of white supremacy, racial capitalism, colonialism, and cis heteropatriarchy, the sexualities of women of color, queers, and trans people of color are commonly understood to demarcate the limits of normative sexuality. They function as the aberrational limit against and through which white, patriarchal, and heteronormative genders and sexualities are defined as universal moral norms. Or such sexualities may be framed as a dead end, making the people who practice them contagi contagiously dangerous subjects who are wrong insofar as we are a threat to the vitality of whiteness's purity complex. Queer, black, and brown practices of desiring, living differently, being otherwise, and being with are thus detained at the margins defining whiteness. So linger on the black band that wraps the limit of the black banded works, and linger on the color black. Untitled The End is accompanied by instructions for the owner or exhibiting party on how to materialize the piece. In the manifestation guidelines supplied to the Museum of Contemporary Art by the Felix Gonzalez Torres Foundation, the museum owns this particular piece, it is specified that the ink used for the work's original manifestation was Pantone Extra Black U. Isn't blackness, as well as brownness and queerness, always already conceived of as a sort of extra? One might think here of Glenn Ligon following Zora Neale Hurston as he fills a white canvas with a blackening abstraction of the thought, I feel most colored when I am thrown against a sharp white background. A similar tension between black and white surface, uh, surfaces connects untitled The End and untitled Republican Years. But where Ligon's repetition of Hurston's phrase suggests, as Huey Copeland notes, the way in which projective investments in racial filiation tend to cloud African-American voices, the starkly segregated black-white dynamics of untitled Republican Years and untitled The End depict an order in which filiation is all altogether impossible. Black is divided from white and held at the periphery. Blackness at and as the limit. The end. 
an ongoing apocalypse in which blackness is held at the margin and periphery by a sharp white center that defines its purity by means of this marginalizing effect, a sharp white center that secures its claim to power by means of this delimitation, detention, and peripheralization of blackness. To describe the Republican years as the end is to gesture to the mounting piles of wreckage, illustrating those years' ongoing impact on black and brown life, the AIDS crisis and its disproportionate effects, mass incarceration, the dismantling of public assistance, the ongoing redistribution of wealth upwards alongside ongoing military expansion both in and out of the nation's violently policed borders, I'm only naming a few but also the end, as in, this is over, we are done with this, we are going beyond this, we have always been going beyond this, which has something to do with blackness as, amongst other things, a collectivity of unbeing beings and a practice of going beyond all knowing known being. Describing the original manifestation of Untitled The End, the manifestation guidelines relay that the border bled to the edge on all four sides of each sheet of paper. This is an exact quote. Here, blackness cannot be contained by the pale gravitational center of whiteness. This blackness at the margin insists on going beyond. It exists in excess of, and yes, sometimes bleeds to the edge. Extra black. To think of blackness as excess or as the act of exceeding is resonant with what Musser describes as brown jouissance. These forms of otherness, excess forms of embodiment that are central to what I call brown jouissance, what she calls brown jouissance. In contrast to an ecstasy that imagines transcending corporeality, brown jouissance is a reveling in fleshiness, its sensuous materiality that brings together pleasure and pain which is another way of capturing what I mean when I refer to the thought that we had while fucking under Untitled The End. The end of Felix, of Ross, of Marlon, and Essex, of the more than 319, 8,000 people who were dead from AIDS in the US by the time it took Gonzalez Torres from us on January 6th, 1996, but also fucking after the end. Three. Imagine if all the people living after that particular and ongoing ending were to gather in front of Untitled The End and project into it the images of the people they were missing and yet to miss. Imagine how quickly that white space would become full with the figures of people whose stories and bodies have been held at the periphery and delimited at the margin. How quickly the space would become dense with black, brown, and other color-rich tones to paint a million different portraits of other ways of being together while reveling in fleshiness, its sensuous materiality that brings together pleasure and pain. Imagine that these projected figures would exceed and bleed past the limits of the frame, densely populating the stark white center to open up the potential for something new to emerge. This potential would emerge through a transformation of the space so radical that we might lose all sense of and need for a center or margin in the first or final place. But imagine also that all of this could happen in a fashion that did not at the same time cloud into abstraction femme, trans, queer, black and brown voices, bodies and lives. Imagine that each projected figure or combination of figures might hold on to all of their singularity and particularity. What if they were remembered as they were and as they wanted to be at the same time? And what if they could still be in relation to the incommensurable plurality of any number of commons through which they moved? The brown commons, the black commons, the queer of color commons, the commons of black feminism and of women of color feminisms, the upon, over, and under commons. Imagine then a being singular plural of femme, trans, queer, black, and brown life that is full with generative surplus, excess, and extra a being singular plural that is tangled together and apart in fleshy embrace, transforming the bounded white rectangular expanse into an endless, shimmering and opaque surface that is apparent but not transparent, 
grasping but ungraspable, knowing but not knowable, enriched with all the yearning of, for, and in the new. Imagine what that would look and feel like, and then wonder that it is not. For the end, a beginning waiting for its title. Thank you. Okay, we've had sex, death, and resurrection, so I imagine that you have some questions. Uh, um, I don't know if there's a microphone out among uh, people. Okay, yeah. wonderful. We have some time for questions. You'll need to raise your hand or something else for me to recognize a question. Yes, on the aisle up, up here. Um, thank you all for wonderful papers and talks. Um, and this question is actually for Josh. So I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more about Amber's concept of like brown jouissance and how we can think about that, you know, during this currently really precarious time. You know, and Wait, can you say that last part again? I just sure, couldn't hear sure. you. Thinking about um, brown jouissance in this current political moment and sort of like precarity of queer of color lives and um, legislation and our current political moment. Like how can we think about that as a uh, survival strategy or as something we can draw upon to sort of think about hope in a weird way? Yeah. I mean, I, like, um... That's kind of how I understand the concept of brown jouissance, right? As, um, uh, uh, I mean, there's a reason that she emphasizes a kind of dialectic of pleasure and pain, um, that the forms of pleasure um, and uh, excess going beyond that emerge in the experience of brown jouissance are precisely um, predicated in response to uh, the ongoing conditions of foreclosure uh, that seem to make that joy impossible, um, but actually give it not only its kind of materiality, but its political force, um, which is why I think, you know, in this um, moment, uh, but also this moment has always been a terrible moment, right? Like I don't want to emphasize the present as particularly terrible because, you know, like the depopulation of the West Coast of Africa was a particularly apocalyptic moment. Um, you know, uh, colonization in all of its various ugly forms were a particular terrible moment, right? Um, but that the forms of pleasure, play, inversion, um, and reversal uh, that we've seen discussed on this panel today gain their power precisely because they are living in relationship to the ongoing impossibility and terribleness of an ongoing present that doesn't seem to end. Other questions? Do you have questions for each other? Such profundity. Uh, we will, shall we leave it at that? And you may approach individually uh, afterwards. So let's give these fabulous papers a hand. Do you know Cynthia Burchow's book on Mary Magdalene? <laughs> Yeah, all the Gnostic. Yeah, all the Gnostic. Yeah.